we are continuing the discussion of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9. We want to just go back a couple of verses just to touch on some points before, to set the context for today's discussion. Our most supremely beautiful and merciful see Krishna in chapter 9, verse 22. He has said, Ananyas chintayantumam ye jana paryupasate Tesham nityabhyuktanam yogakshema vaham yaham. For those devotees who are constantly absorbed in profound meditation upon me, realizing me within hearts, then for those persons, whatever they need in their life and whatever they have, I personally bring and I personally protect them. Bahamiham, I carry all their necessities myself and I protect what they have. So, in the commentary, Srila Baladevi Dibhushan mentions that here, see, Krishna is explaining a sutra of the Vedanta Sutra, that is Vedanta Sutra 3, 4, 44. It's very beautiful. There it is said, Swaminaha falasrute ityatrayaha. Swaminaha means from the Lord. Fal means the fruit. Srute means from the scripture. Iti means thus it is spoken. Atrayaha means uh, Datatreya, the great sage Datatreya, who is, his name is Atrayaha because he's the son of Atri Rishi. So in this sutra, it, the, the meaning is Swaminaha Falasute Ityatrayaha, that in the life of a pure devotee, in the life of a person who is fully dedicated to Krishna's service, then the fruit of his activity is not coming from karma, but Swaminaha, from Swami, that is from Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. He himself is bringing everything that the devotee needs. And Vyasadeva in the Sutra is saying, this is the opinion of the great sage Dattatreya. Then, in the next sutra, also a very beautiful sutra, Vyasadeva is writing, Atvidyam itil audalomis tasmai hi parikriyate. Now remember that in Gita, Sri Krishna said, Vedanta krit veda videda vachaham. By all the Vedas I am to be known. Indeed, I myself have compiled the Vedanta Sutra. So Krishna, the speaker of Bhagavad Gita, has appeared in the form of Vyasadeva and uh, compiled the Vedanta Sutra. So, and so we can see that what Krishna is saying in Gita and what Krishna is saying in Vedanta Sutra Sometimes the Vedanta Sutra is giving some explanation of the verses of Gita and vice versa. So in the next sutra, the uh, Vedanta is saying, Atvidyam iti odalamis tasmaihi parikriyate. That means, uh, now the great sage Odalomi, his opinion is that the Supreme Lord, Atvidyam means, is like a Ritvik priest. Now, don't take this to be some support of the philosophy of the Ritviks. <laughs> the uh, Ritvik priest means that when a king or some a householder wants to perform a sacrifice, then he'll call for a priest to come. And the priest, will, the priest is not the guru of that person, but rather he's just being paid to perform the sacrifice. And uh, so therefore the Ritvik, he is famous as, as a priest who's basically selling his services. So in this Sutra of Vedanta, it is said, Atvijyamiti Adalomis, that the great sage Odalumi says that the Supreme Lord, who's supplying all the necessities of life to the devotee, is like a Vrikvik priest. Why? The next part of the Sutra says, Tasmaihi Parikriyate. 
uh, because just as the Ritvik is selling himself, so in the same way, see Krishna, he sells himself to his devotee. Mm-hmm. So in the uh, Vishnu Dharma Uttara Purana and in the Brihat Gautama Tantra, there's a famous verse, Tulasi Dalamatrena, Jalasya Chulkenacha, Vikrinite Swatmanam Bhakti Vyo Bhakta Vatsala. The Supreme Lord eh, is Bhakta Vatsala. He's very merciful to his devotees. Why? Because if the devotee will offer a tulsi leaf and some water to him, then he sells himself to that devotee. So the idea here is that, of course, Krishna is not uh, a businessman, but he sells himself for the price of the devotee's love. Krishna himself is purchased by the love of his devotee. So, of all of the qualities of Sri Krishna, two qualities are prominent above all the other qualities. Yes, Krishna is all-powerful, Krishna is all-knowing, Krishna is omnipresent, Krishna is, uh, can speak every language, Krishna is a great genius who can achieve many different objectives by a single action. So in this way, 64 qualities of Krishna have been described. But of all the qualities of Krishna, two are prominent. And one is Bhaktivat Salata, that is his affection for his devotee. And the other quality is Prema Vasita, that he is controlled by love. These two go together. Because of his affection for his devotee, he is controlled by their love. So, here in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is saying, Yoga Ksema Bahami Aham. If someone is fully absorbed in me, then whatever he needs, I bring that, and what he has, I uh, protect it. Now, one may say, but the pure devotee, they never ask Krishna for anything and they don't want to bother him. So, it's really not a botheration for Krishna for two reasons. The first reason is this. Uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was instructing Srila Sanatana Goswami, he taught Srila Sanatana Goswami a verse. And th- this verse was spoken by Uddhav in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam to Vidura. After Sri Krishna had left this world, Uddhav was feeling so much separation and he's glorifying Krishna to Vidura. And Mm. Uddhav is speaking about the great opulence, the great powers, the unlimited, unimaginable opulence of Sri Krishna. And so, quoting this verse of Uddhav, he says, Swayam Tvasamyatishayastrayadisha Samuraja Lakshmyapta Samasta Karma Balim Harabd the meaning is this. Swayam tua asamya atishai. No one is equal to Krishna. No one is greater than Sri Krishna. Trayadisha. He's the Lord of three. That means he's the Lord of the material world and the living entities and the spiritual energy, the spiritual world as well. He's the Lord of three, means he's the Lord of the three Vishnus, Karnadakashai Vishnu, Kaprakashai Vishnu, and Chirdakashai Vishnu. That is the Lord of three also means that on his planet Krishna Lok, there are three dimensions. Uh, that is uh, Dwarka, Natura, and Vrindavan. So in a way, there are many different meanings of Triadisha, how Sri Krishna is, is the Lord of Threes. So, Swayam Tvasamya Tishayas Triadisha. Now, Samraja Lakshmyapta Samasta Kama means that whatever Krishna wants, it's automatically fulfilled because his Shaktis, the mm, Maha Lakshmi, the Goddess of Fortune, and so many other Shaktis, they're 
they're completely attentive at every moment that whatever desire Krishna has in his heart, all of his female energies, his shaktis are fulfilling those desires. So if Sri Krishna wants to do something, if he wants to take care of his devotee, he's so powerful, he can do that. Balin Haradbis Chiralokapala, that all the devatas in all the, who are the uh, predominating demigods of all the ten directions, they're all his servants. And Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Indra, Chandra, Surya, the sun god, all of the demigods, they come and they visit Sri Krishna. And when each one comes, they think I'm the only one there, but there are actually millions of devatas coming all at the same time. And when they bow down at Krishna's lotus feet, then the tips of their golden jeweled crowns touch the ground and make a tremendous sound as they all bow down at his lotus feet. So by this verse, Uddhav is expressing the astonishing power and opulence of Sri Krishna. In fact, when Mahaprabhu said this verse, he said, that no one in the universe has ever heard of such vast opulence as the opulence of Sri Krishna. In fact, simply by, simply by hearing the, about the opulence of Krishna, one's heart becomes cleansed of all material conceptions. So uh, this is an answer to the question, but if a devotee needs something, isn't it a problem for Krishna to uh, take care of all his devotees wherever they are in the world? And the answer is no, because he's so unlimitedly powerful uh, that he can easily fulfill all desires. So it's no problem for him. And on the other hand, it's a great pleasure for Krishna. Krishna feels great satisfaction in serving his devotees. In fact, without that, Krishna even, he doesn't want to live without his devotees. Now there's another meaning here of Tesham Nitya Bhyuktanam Yoga Kshema Vaham Yaham and that is Nitya Abhyuktanam can refer to devotees who desire to be with Krishna forever, to be Nitya Yukta. So, Tesham Nitya Abhyuktanam, for those desires, who, those devotees, sorry, who uh, desire to always be with Sri Krishna, then Yoga Ksema Vahamyaham means that I take responsibility for their attaining yoga, that means meeting with me. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 8, then Sri Krishna describes how a yogi has to leave at the right time. He shouldn't, a yogi should not give up his body when the, the sun is traveling in the Dakshinayana, in the southern course. But the yogi should wait until the sun has moved into Uttarayana, into the northern course. We see an example of um, Bhishma Dev, out of humility, he was lying on his bed of arrows and he would not leave this world until the sun had gone into the northern course. Of course, this doesn't apply to uh, Bhishma Dev because he's a pure devotee. But out of humility, he waited for the sun to come into the northern course. And of course, most of all, the deeper meaning is that he was waiting for Sri Krishna to come and see him in his final moments. Anyway, in chapter 8, there's a description how the devotee, sorry, how the yogi gets liberation from this world. And the first step is you have to leave at the particular auspicious time, not at an inauspicious time. And then you are, your soul will be uh, carried by the Ativahik devatas, different demigods, uh, the demigod of the night, the demigod of the uh, light fortnight, and so on, to the sun planet. And so there's a, a description of how the yogi has to fulfill so many conditions in order to get liberated uh, from this world. But in chapter 12 
of Bhagavad Gita, verse 7, Sri Krishna said, Teishamaham samudarta mityu samsara sagarat bhavami natirad parka mai aveshtita chaitasam. Sri Krishna said, those who are my aveshita chaitasam, their chitta is avesh. That, mean, that means their mind is completely absorbed. Um, for those persons whose minds are absorbed in me, then I swiftly deliver them from the ocean of birth and death. In other words, it doesn't matter at what time the devotee leaves this world, in what situation the devotee leaves this world, he's not dependent on his own strength and he's not dependent on the time or he's not dependent on the uh, intervention of any other devotees, but rather Sri Krishna himself personally comes and takes that devotee to the spiritual world. So this is also a meaning here of yoga Sema Vaham Yaham, that for one who is always absorbed in me, I personally manage their yoga. That means they're meeting with me. I bring them to me because they are nitya biyuktanam. They desire to stay with me forever. So if we take this meaning of the verse, then yoga kshema baham yaham. Yoga means meeting and kshema means maintenance. So to maintain the meeting means that when I bring them to me, then I maintain that association with them. I never let them become separated from me. Now one may say, uh, but we see that that's not true because even the great devotees, they experience separation. Krishna is saying, Yoga Ksayma Vahamyaha, I personally bring the devotees into my association and Shema, I maintain them, means that I never let them be separated from me. But we see in Sri Krishna's Leela that even those who have prayed, even the gopis of Vrindavan and even Radharani, they experience pastimes of separation. So we can reconcile it in this way. As the great uh, poet and the, the, the grandson of Srinivas Acharya has, uh, has written in the psalm, Vande Vishwam Bharapar Kamalam Kandita Kali Yuga Janamala Shamalam Surabha Kashita Nija Janamadupam Karuna Kandita Viravitapam Karuna Kandita Viravitapam He's saying that Lord Chaitanya he attracts all the devotees by the fragrance of his name, form, qualities, and pastimes. And those devotees are like bumblebees who are attracted to his lotus feet. And karuna kandita virahavitapam. And when they're, in, they're feeling the pain of separation with him, by his causeless mercy, he breaks apart. He destroys their pain of separation. How? By appearing to them in the form of a spurti. So in this verse, Sri Krishna is saying, Yoga Kshema Baham Yaham. If someone is absorbed in serving me and they want to be with me forever, then I arrange to bring them to my lotus feet and I maintain their association with me, even though sometimes, according to the Leela, they are separated, but I'm always with them uh, because. I appear to them in the spurti in the heart and sometimes outwardly as an avirbhav uh, in the intensity of their love in separation. So yoga kseima vaham yaham. Very, very beautiful verse. So now we're coming to see Krishna goes on to say that if persons are um, devoted to other uh, gods, demigods, and worship them with faith. They're actually worshiping me, but they're doing it in a wrong way because it's not um, direct. Though the demigods are my opulences, it is not directly me. They are manifestation of Sri Krishna's external energy. And because of that, if they don't recognize that there are not many issuers, many controllers, or they don't recognize 
that uh, the Leela Bihari, Krishna, the enjoyer of pastimes, is the ultimate reality, then those persons gradually uh, fall down and take birth again and again in the material world. So those who worship demigods go to the planets of the demigods. Those who worship their fathers, forefathers go to the planets of their forefathers. Those who worship ghosts and spirits, yakshas and rakshasas, they go to those planets. But all of those abodes are temporary. And so after that particular karma is exhausted, then again, they come back to earth. But Krishna says, opimam. Those who worship me come to me. In other words, by worshipping the eternal Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, one attains the eternal abode. And by worshipping various temporary devatas, one gets a temporary result and then returns to from wherever he came. In, in other words, that's futile, complete waste of time. So now we're coming to the very famous verse of uh, Bhagavad Gita. That is verse 26. Patram pushpam palam trayam yome bhaktiya prayatschati tadaham bhakti paritam ashramu prayatat manaha. See, Krishna is saying that if one worships me, if one offers me a leaf, patram, like a tulsi leaf or some spinach, mm, mm, or just a leaf from the forest. Patram pushpam, a flower. Palam, a fruit or some water. Then if one offers it with devotion, I accept it. Here Krishna is making a contrast because the worship of the devatas, the demigods, worship of forefathers and the other types of worship mentioned before are all quite complicated, expensive, elaborate and uh, difficult to perform. And Krishna is saying, look, Worshipping me is very, very easy, very easy, because I can be satisfied by things which are available in the forest for free. So here Krishna is uh, essentially expressing his strong desire, that is called lalan icha, the desire to be pampered. Lalana icha, that's called lalan icha. Krishna loves to be pampered by his devotees. So one may say that's quite a vain thing to, to like to be pampered by others. But the real reason is that when the devotees serve Krishna, the, when Krishna gives them the, the privilege of serving him, then the devotees themselves feel extreme bliss. So, and also for those whose love is very, very high, Krishna feels it's a great privilege for himself that they love him and that they serve him and he also wants to serve them. So there are many uh, examples in Shastra and uh, our Acharyas have mentioned them of devotees who had love and that love causes the Supreme Lord to become hungry for their offering. Perhaps you may remember when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was uh, inquiring from uh, Ramananda Rai about the goal of life. Then at one point, Ramananda Rai said, Nano Pachara Kritapujama Ata Bandho Prem Naiva Bhakta Ridayam Dutta Vidya Tamsyat Yavat Chudasti Jatare Jatrata Pipasa Tavad Sukaya Bhavato Nano Bhakshapeye. It's a very important verse. In this verse, it's saying, Nano Pachara Kritapujana. If a person serves Krishna with a nan upacha, that means various mm, types of uh, articles which are offered in the rituals of archana. So, for example, when we do archana, when we formally do puja to the deity, we offer sodasha upacha, 16 upacha, 16 articles, which include um, a flowers, a seat, foot bathing water, Mm, hand washing water, mouth washing water, incense, a lamp, um, and uh, oil for massage, some ornaments, some cloth, and uh, fanning, and so on, uh, some uh, naivedya, some food. 
So in this way, these are the 16 types of upachar according to the uh, pancharatric system, the scriptures called uh, such as Narad Pancharatra. And the Supreme Lord himself has said that I promise that I will personally appear to that devotee who worships me according to the system of offering Saudash Upachar, these 16 articles following the directions of the Pancharatra scripture. So here in this verse says, Nano Pachara Kritapujama Atabandho. Atabandhu is the name of Krishna. It means the friend, the bandhu of the Artha, the person who is suffering, the friend of the suffering. But in this verse, it has a very special meaning. Prem naiva bhakta ridayam sukha vidrutamshat. It says that if a devotee has love, has prem, then when they offer these articles, then their heart is melting with joy. Why is that? Why does the, the devotee's heart melt with joy? Now the reason is this. The name Artabandhu, the friend of the distressed, means not that that devotee is feeling the distress of material existence. Because a, a devotee's consciousness is transcendental to all the dualities. In Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 2, Sri Krishna has said, Yam hina vyatyanti etei purusham purusha shabha samadhu ka sukam diram somratatvaya kalpate. A person who is steady in happiness and distress and considers them to be the same, that person is eligible to be liberated from material existence. So a devotee is the crest jewel of all liberated persons. They have no concern with the happiness and distress of this world. So Artabandhu doesn't mean the friend of the person who's suffering because whatever, his dog has died or his wife has left him or whatever, his uh, business has gone bankrupt. Here, Artabandhu means that person who wants to serve Krishna so much that when he's making offerings, he's crying and thinking, Oh my Lord, please accept my offering. If you will not accept this offering, then I will die. I will not be able to live if you will not accept my offering. What is the use of being alive if I cannot serve you, if I cannot please you? So this pain, this pain of separation, this pain of feeling ineligible and unqualified, and insignificant that my life is worthless if Krishna will not accept my service. Krishna is the friend of that person. So, Nano Pachara Krita Pujana Arta Bando Prainaiva Bhakta Sukaya Druta Vridjitam Shat Druta means here, Druta means melting. Vidyutamsyat, Riddhi Vidyamsyat. The heart of the devotee is melting with happiness. And the reason is this. It's explained in the next part of the verse. Yavatsu dasti jatare jarata pipasa. If and only if you are hungry and thirsty, then when food is placed before you, you'll eat it and you'll feel pleasure. If you're not hungry and food is before you, then you will not eat it. If, even if you have to eat it, it will be painful to eat it even. So the next part of the verse is saying that happiness depends upon the thirst and the hunger that you have. So in the same way here, the meaning is when the devotee has praying, love for Sri Krishna, then that praying causes a hunger in the heart of Krishna to accept the offering. And so because Krishna is hungry, Krishna is thirsty, then with great eagerness, he takes the offering of that devotee. And when Krishna is satisfied by tasting the offering, then Yasmin Tushte Jagat Tushtam. The whole universe is satisfied when God is satisfied. So then the devotee, his heart is melting with happiness, which is the reaction to Krishna's happiness, which is, the, which is due to the fulfillment of his hunger, which was caused by the devotee's love. So, uh, this is the uh, essence of this verse. 
patram pushpam palantayam yome bhakta priyatsati that if someone offers the um, a leaf, a fruit, a flower, or water to me with love, then ashnami, I eat it. Ashnami literally means eat. Generally, it's translated as I accept it, but ashnami literally means eat. Um, very often, it's translated as accept because patram pushpam, pushpa is a flower, and generally, you don't eat flowers. Of course, there are some edible flowers, um, but generally, when people offer flowers to Krishna, they're meant for decoration. But uh, Srila Vishnu Chakitakura comments that actually sometimes uh, Krishna is so overwhelmed with love for his devotee that just by seeing his devotee, he becomes bewildered. And when the devotee offers a flower, then Krishna by accident, <coughs> he eats it. So that just speaks to the tremendous uh, power of bhakti that even the Supreme Lord who can bewilder everyone becomes bewildered by the preem of his devotee. So there are um, so many examples illustrating this verse, such as Sudama Brahmin. Sudama Brahmin was an old school friend of Krishna when he was in Gurukul. And many years later, he came to visit Krishna in Dwarka. And as you know, Sudama Brahmin was um, very, extremely poor. He barely had enough to eat. He was very lean and thin. And he lived in a, in a broken down shack and he barely had the necessities of life, but he was happy, engaged in Krishna's service. And when he came to see Krishna, his wife had made him take some dry, uncooked, chipped rice uh, in a cloth. And he was too embarrassed to give it to Krishna. But Krishna himself said, hey, what's that under your arm? And he snatched it away from him. And then Krishna began to eat it and he took one bite and then he was about to take another bite and Rukmini checked the hand of Krishna and said, oh, this is not for you because she was concerned. She was thinking, oh, my husband has a very delicate stomach and if he'll eat these dry things, he'll feel some discomfort. But yet Krishna, he was uh, tasting Amrita, nectar, in this dry chip rice of Sudama Brahman. Analogous to that pastime is also a pastime in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela. Perhaps you know that after Nimai Pandit came back from Gaya, after he'd been initiated by Srila Ishwar Puri, after he'd given up his pride as being a great scholar, then um, our Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that time Nimai Pandit, he became very humble, more humble than a blade of grass. And he was very eager to associate it with devotees. So the first day that he returned to Navadweep, he went to his home, but he gave a message, oh, please meet me the next morning in the Suplamba Bhavan, that is the house of Suplamba Brahmachari. So this is very significant. And the significance is this, that Suplamba Brahmachari was very, very poor also. And uh, he used to wander all over Navadweep, just with a cloth bag over his shoulder, chanting the holy names. And when he used to chant the names of Krishna, tears of love were streaming from his eyes. And he used to go door to door and he used to beg something. And, uh, and people treated him with disdain. Uh, many people thought, oh, who is this beggar? Get out of here. Why don't you get a job? And, but still, he used to go to every house. What to speak of going to the house of uh, wealthy persons or middle class persons? He even used to visit poor persons who were just living in some improvised dwellings. If you've been to India, you've probably seen plenty of those improvised dwellings. So he also used to go there. And so they're also very poor. And he would beg something from them also. And at the end of the day, he used to return to his home. And whatever he'd collected, he would offer that to Krishna and then take the remnant. So even though poverty is can be very crushing for a person. But uh, Shukumba, he never felt any pain or suffering of poverty. He was very, very blissful. And no one really understood what a great devotee he was. Who can recognize great devotee? We were discussing on, a few days ago on the appearance day of Gadara Pandit that even Gadara Pandit, he has the pastime of being unable to recognize Pundrik Vidyanidhi's 
exalted status as a great Vaishnava. So in the same way, no one knew that this Shuklamba Brahmachari was internally deeply connected with the Supreme Lord in a relationship of the eternal, unbreakable and perfect love. So when Nimai Pandit came back from Gaya, the first place he went to, uh, after coming to his own house, the next day, the first place he went to was the house of Shuklamba Brahmachari. And the reason was because he wanted to have his association. He wanted to hear the pastimes of Krishna. Nimai Pandit was feeling great separation from Krishna. And he was thinking, if I hear the pastimes of Krishna from his great devotee Shuklamba Brahmachari, then I'll feel some uh, inspiration and some relief. So uh, we see that there's a famous pastime that after some time, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in the house of Shiva's Pandit, and he moved the Shalagram Shilas off the altar, he picked them up in a cloth, put them to one side, and he sat on the altar of Shiva's Thakur, and he began to manifest his own Bhagavata, that he himself is Krishna to the devotees and give blessings to the devotees. At that time, all the devotees, they were doing kirtan. And the Shuklamba Brahmachari came there and he joined in the dancing. But as it was typical for him, he still had his cloth bag over his shoulder. He was dancing with his cloth bag on and he was very, very happy. So at that time, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he called Shuklamba Brahmachari and said, come here, come here. And Shukamba Brahmachari approached him. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said to him, birth after birth, you have been my impoverished devotee. Always, though yourself remained a beggar, you're offering everything to me. And you are fully satisfied by that. I also desire uh, your offerings. And if you don't uh, give any, if you have something and you don't give it to me, then I must take it by force. And then Chaitanya Mapu jumped up and he thrust his hand into the cloth bag of Shuklamba Brahmachari. It's very, it's very interesting because if you see the um, Vairagis, renounced persons in Brindavan who are begging, they always have a cloth bag. And in the bottom of their bag, there's always some dried uncooked rice, <laughs> which has fallen out of some cloth or something. And it's there in the bottom of the bag. So, um, Shuklamba Bra uh, Brahmachari was like that. There were some broken pieces of rice in the bottom of his cloth bag. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by force thrust his hand in there and pulled it out and started eating it. And uh, as he was taking it again and again, he, he was finding all the small pieces and he ate all of them. And he said to Shuklamba, Oh, when I was in Dwarka, I snatched away your chip rice that you had hidden from me. And now I'm snatching away your chip rice again. Even though Rukmini took my hand and uh, to try to stop me, but now she will not stop me. And, <laughs> and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took everything. So we can see it's a very beautiful remnant of Krishna Leela that Rukmini held the hand of Krishna and he couldn't eat the, all, the, all the flat rice, the chip rice of uh, Sudama. But now in Gora Leela, Rukmini was not uh, there, could not stop him and he could eat everything. So then Shuklamba Brahmachari said, what, do you, what have you done? This uh, rice is just in broken pieces. And then the Supreme Lord said, Bhaktera Dravyu Prabhu Kari Kari Kai Abhaktera Dravya Prabhu Ulati Nachai which means that if a devotee mm, has something I don't wait for him to offer it. By force, I'll come and take it. But if a non-devotee even makes an offering, I have no desire at all. So as Mahaprabhu was speaking in this way, all the devotees were watching and they were uh, crying and singing in joy, thinking, just see how merciful uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is to Shukamba uh, Brahmachari. So, here there's a, a reference to um, the pastimes of uh, Sridhama Brahman and uh, Krishna in Dwarka. But in the Gauragana Deshidipika of Kavi Karnapur, there it is said that Sudama Brahman came in Gauralila 
as a Banamali Bikshu, Bikshuk Banamali, the, the, the uh, beggar, mendicant named Banamali. And it said that um, Shuklamba Brahmachari is actually the incarnation of one of the wives of the Yagyeka Brahmanas. So you have heard that pastime also from the Srimad Bhagavatam that once Krishna, he sent his friends to go and beg something to eat from some Karmakanda Brahmanas, but they didn't give anything. So then Krishna sent the wives, uh, sent his friends to beg from the wives and the wives just took everything that they cooked for their husband's Yagya. And instead of taking it there, they came through the forest and met with Sri Krishna in Ashokvan, in the, the, uh, that is now uh, Batral in, in Vrindavan on the bank of the Jamuna there. And they offered their, um, their preparations to see Krishna there, and Krishna happily took it. But here in Goralila, now one of the wives of those Brahmanas even is not offering, even she hasn't even cooked it yet, it's still raw. And Krishna is coming in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and snatching that. So here in Bhagavad Gita, see Krishna is saying, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktiya Prayatati. Tanam Bhaktiparitam Ashnami Prayatatmanaha. This verse also has some other very fascinating elements. Here Krishna is saying Ashnami Prayatatmanaha. So Prayatatmanaha means that the devotee should be pure hearted. So who is a pure who is a pure hearted uh, devotee? This is a point of controversy. Who is that pure-hearted devotee from whom Krishna accepts the offering? So our acharyas have given an example, uh, which is from the um, second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. There it is said, Dautatma Purusha Krishna Padamulam Namunchati Muktasava Pariklesha Pantaswasha Namyata. It means that um, Daut Atma Purusha. Here, Atma means the soul and Dauta means cleansed. So Daut Atma. A person whose heart has been cleansed. And here in the verse of Bhagavad Gita, Ashnami Prayatatmana. Prayatatmana means Daut Atmana. Hmm? So Prayatatma and Daut Atma mean the same. So we're referencing from Bhagavad Gita now to this verse of second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Dautatma Purusha Krishna Padamulam Namanchati. A pure hearted person is defined as that person who never gives up the lotus feet of Krishna. Now, this is very significant because it gives room for a person who has dedicated their life to Krishna and they'll never give up his service, but they're not yet completely free from lust or anger. It may be sometimes they experience some attraction. It may be sometimes they become angry over something. But despite whatever remaining faults may be there in that devotee, because padamulam na munchati, they'll never give up devotional service. So Krishna accepts them as being pure-hearted. So that is the meaning of ashtami prayatatmanaha. Now, a question may be raised. Someone may say, how is it that the love of the devotee, the bhakti of the devotee, makes hunger in the stomach of Krishna? Or he is hunger to accept any type of offering. It doesn't have to be only an offering of food. It can be drink. It can be a decoration. It can be a massage. It can be a kirtan, a song. It can be fanning. Just see Krishna is is hungry to accept all the loving services of his devotees. How is that? So for that, we'll have to look at the explanation, uh, which is given in the, in the ninth canto of Shema and Bhagavatam, in the chapter, uh, canto nine, uh, chapter four, verse 64. There, see Krishna has said, Naham atmanam ashase, magbaktai sadubi bina. Sriyam Chatyantikim Brahman Yesham Gati Ahampara. So you have to admire the 
the economy of Sri Krishna's expression here. There, um, in three lines of this verse, Sri Krishna is describing actually three types of joy, three types of bliss. So let's look at the, the verse line by line. Krishna, this is actually uh, Krishna speaking to a Devasa Rishi and he's glorifying his great devotees such as Ambrish Maharaj. He says, first of all, Naham Atmanam Ashase, I don't want, Ashase means I do not desire Atmanam, that is the happiness of my Atma. Hmm? That is, that means related to Krishna's own Satchitananda Vigra, the form of Krishna is made of condensed bliss. Krishna is Satchitananda Vigra, the very embodiment of eternity, knowledge and bliss. Hmm? So Krishna said, I don't want the bliss that comes from my own form. Mad Bhaktai Sadhubi Bina, without my devotees. If I don't have my devotees, then even my own spiritual form doesn't give me happiness. Sriyam Chattantikim Brahman. And, O oh Brahman, I don't want the happiness that comes from Sri, that means from my opulence. Yesham uh, Gate Ahampara, without those devotees for whom I am the supreme shelter. Now, this verse is describing three types of bliss. So let's analyze this uh, step by step. Ananda can first be divided into two types. That is called Swarup Ananda and Swarup Shakti Ananda. The first one, Swarup Ananda, refers to the joy of Krishna's own uh, form. Swarup means own form. So Krishna being the embodiment of bliss is by his nature always blissful. That is called Swarup Ananda, the joy of his own spiritual form. Uh, so that's mentioned in the first line of this verse from the ninth canto. Nahamat Nam Asha say, I don't want the joy of my own form. If I cannot be with my devotees. Now, the second type of, of bliss is called Swarup Shakti Ananda. That is the Ananda, the joy coming from Krishna's Swarup Shakti. He, that means the Ananda, the the bliss which comes from his Swarup and which is non different from his Swarup is called Swarup Shakti. Swarup Shakti. The Shakti, the power which is, comes from his form and which is non different from his form is called Swarup Shakti. So that also causes bliss to him. And that Swarup Shakti Ananda is divided into two parts. One is called Aishwarya Ananda, that is the joy of opulences. In other words, his power is manifesting the beauty of the spiritual world and mm, all the treasures of, and, and, and joys of Vaikuntha. So that is the Aishwarya Ananda. And then the other aspect of Saurabh Shakti Ananda is called the Manasa Ananda, the joy of Krishna's mind, his mental joy, if you like, Manasa Ananda. So that Manasananda is the joy that Krishna feels in his heart when he exchanges love with his devotees. That is called the Manasananda. The joy that he feels when his devotees serve him and the joy that he feels in his heart when he gives a chance for his devotees to serve him. The joy that he feels in his heart when he sees how happy his devotees are. So that's all called Manasananda. And it comes from his loving relationship with his devotees. So uh, in this verse of the ninth canto, see Krishna is comparing the um, Swarupananda, the joy of his own form, and the joy of Swarup Shakti Ananda in the feature of Aishwarya Ananda, the joy of his own opulences. And he's comparing these two and saying, I don't want them. And without my devotees, that is, the, the manasananda, the joy I feel from giving joy to my devotees, from seeing their joy, from accepting their service, is far superior to the pleasure of my own form, and it is superior to the pleasure I get from my opulences. 
this. So an example is uh, given in the uh, Padma Purana to illustrate that. And that is the example of a person playing a flute. When a person uh, breathes in, then air is inside them. And that air, of course, <laughs> without breathing, uh, uh, you cannot stay alive. But when you breathe, that's pleasurable. But when that breath, the same breath goes inside the flute, then that breath, uh, which was uh, uniform in nature, now takes the form of many different varieties of music. And that music can express joy, it can express thoughtfulness, it can express peacefulness, it can express excitement, romance, uh, uh, heroism. Music can express all the different rasas. So in the same way, see Krishna gets a type of the uniform bliss from the Swarup Shakti in his own form. But when that Swarup Shakti goes into the heart of his devotee, then it takes on a variety of different forms in the form of the Dasyaras, Sakyaras, Vatsalyaras, Maduyaras, the love of uh, friendship, the love of parent parents and the love of uh, his sweethearts. And that gives him more pleasure. And uh, he becomes very eager, very hungry to experience that. That is a joy that he cannot experience if he's alone. He can only, be, he can only experience that with his devotees. So in that sense, he's dependent upon his devotees for that happiness. And therefore, uh, Sri Krishna becomes hungry when the devotee has uh, prayed. So we're looking, Patram Pushpam Palam Tayam Yomai Bhaktya Prayatiti Tadaham Bhaktyuparitam Ashnami Prayatatmanaha So now, Sri Krishna is coming in the next verse, this is very fascinating. Text uh, 27. Yat karoshi, yad ashnasi, yad jahusi dasi yat, yat tapasyasi kontiata kurushva, madapanam. So the meaning is, whatever you do, yat karoshi, whatever you do, yad ashnasi, whatever you eat, yad juhosi, Whatever you offer in sacrifice, the dati yat, whatever you give in charity, yat tapasyasi, and whatever austerities you perform, kontaya tat kurushva madarpanam, hey Arjun, do that as an offering to me. Now, the essence of this verse can only be understood in the context of the flow, the suite of verses that Sri Krishna is speaking here. See, Krishna has just spoken about Ananyas Chintayantomam. For those who are always serving me, continuously, fully absorbed in me. So those persons, they are like Suklamba Brahmachari. They are like the, Bra the Brahmin we spoke of last week, Arjun Mishra. Uh, they are persons who have given up all the karmas, all the duties of this world, all the Vedic prescribed duties, and they're just serving Krishna. How will they survive? They're just begging. And somehow or other, Krishna is, they're surviving, it seems, externally. But actually, Krishna is maintaining them in all ways. So, Arjun is not in that category. Now, as we know, Arjun is a pure devotee. But for the sake of Bhagavad Gita to be uh, being spoken, he's playing the role of a, a Katriya, a warrior in this world, who is confused about what to do in life and now he's in this catch-22 situation where uh, if, he, if he is killed in the battle, then he'll die. And if he wins the battle, then he'll have to do that at the expense of killing some family members, his own half-brothers, his teacher, his gurus uh, and like uh, Bhishma and Dronacharya. And so he won't be able to live afterwards. Everything will be tainted by the blood of uh, his loved ones. So he's having a breakdown. So Arjun, you have to look at Bhagavad Gita in this sense, uh, that Arjun is playing the role of a conditioned soul. So uh, the, the, the meaning of this verse, Krishna is saying to him, Hey Arjun, you are 
not qualified to be like that, Ananyas Chintayanto Mam, a person who has left all the karmas just to be fully absorbed in me. Why? Because Krishna has already said in chapter 3, what is the adhikar, the eligibility of Arjun in this Leela? Now, don't think I'm saying that Arjun is not a pure devotee. He's a pure devotee, but for the sake of this Leela, for Bhagavad Gita to be spoken, he's playing the role of a, a conditioned soul with a certain level of adhikar, and so that through him, Krishna can instruct us who may have that same type of adhikar. So earlier in chapter 3, Sri Krishna said, Kama dieva dikara ste na paleshu kadachana, na kama falahe tu bo, na te sangos to karmani. Hey Arjun, you have the adhikar to do your duties, but don't be attached to the results. Hmm? Right? So, in this context, Krishna is saying that Arjun, his, his level of adhikar is he can't leave everything and just do bhakti, he'll have to do his duties. But he should do his duty, he should practice bhakti and along with that perform his duties without attachment to the result and offer the result of the work to Krishna. But Krishna has said this that is called the um, Bhagavad Arpita Nishkarma Karm, Yoga and it is the um, Karma Gyan Mishra Pardani Bhuti Bhakti that is Pardani. Uh, Bhuta Bhakti, the devotional service, the life, which is mainly devotional service, predominated by devotional service, but still at the same time, a person is doing his duty without attachment to the result and offering the fruit of that to Sri Krishna. But now Sri Krishna is very mercifully bestowing upon Arjun the eligibility to do something even more than that. Something more. He's saying, offer everything you do, everything you eat, and so on. So, let's just have a look at the, the sliding scale of activities and attitudes which are leading a conditioned soul towards the state of uh, pure bhakti. So, the first one is, for example, karma yoga. Karma yoga means that a person is performing the prescribed duties in the Vedas. But at first, he's attached to the result. So you'll have to get the result. This is a very, this is lowest level. Of course, in Kali Yuga, people don't even do their duties. So superior to the unethical person who doesn't do his duties is the ethical person who does his duty. But he, he's doing it to get the result of the duty. He's working to get the money, to get the money to enjoy, whatever. Then higher than that is the person who performs his duties, which are the scriptural injunctions of Varnashram Dharma, without attachment to the result. So then that person who's acting without attachment to the result is going to become free from the effect of Rajagun, the mode of passion. Because rajas means uh, not being here in the now, in the eternally present time, but rather acting always with a dream of how you will enjoy the fruit of this work. So when a person gives up being motivated by enjoying the fruits, then naturally the effect of rajas, which is makes dreaming, whether you're asleep dreaming or whether you're awake dreaming, Rajas makes this dreaming. So when one works without attachment to the result, then the effect of Rajas starts to go down in the mind. So that's superior. But then superior to that is the Nishkam Karma Yoga, but it is Bhagavad Apita. It is offered to God. So now the person is not only doing his prescribed Vedic duties in Varnashram Dharma, He's not only not meditating on the results, giving up the, the fruit, but at the end of the day, he comes uh, uh, before the Supreme Lord and he prays, Oh my Lord, whatever I've done today, I'm offering this to you. So this is superior. Now, what Krishna is saying in this verse, 
is even superior to that for a number of reasons. First of all, it is said in the Padma Purana, Vanashrama Charavata Purushena Parapuman Vishnu Arangite Panta Nanya Tatto Shakaranam. This was the first verse spoken by Ramananda Wright to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in their discussion about the goal of life. And there it is said that a person should perform his duties in Varnashram Dharma and this is the way of worshipping Vishnu. Hmm? Because Yajna Vai Vishnu, the sacrifice of prescribed duty is for the worship of Vishnu, the Purusha Avatar. There are three Vishnus and they're the three Purusha Avatars and they are worshipped. Vishnu, the Purusha, is worshipped by the performance of prescribed duties. So, there is no other way to satisfy Vishnu. So, the Nishkarm Karma Yoga, Bhagavad Aparte Nishkarm Karma Yoga, is, means the work is done without attachment to the results and offered to, as a form of worship to Vishnu. But here in this verse, Sri Krishna is saying, Madarpanam, offer it to me. So that's directly to me, not to Vishnu. Not to the Paramatma, not to the, um, the Purusha avatar, to me. So Krishna himself, being Bhagavan, is superior to even that um, performance of Varnashram Dharma, which is done as a sacrifice, Yagya Vai Vishnu. Now, the second reason that this verse is superior to, to that even Krishna Arpita, Krishna Arpita, Nishkarm Karma Yoga is, that in that Nishkarm Karma Yoga, only the Vedic prescribed duties are offered, but not everything, not the ordinary activities of life, then uh, they, are, they are not uh, offered. Whereas here, Krishna is just saying, whatever you do, everything that you do, not only Vedic duties, but all the things that you are doing, you should do that as an offering to me. Hmm? So for this reason, it's also superior. Now, if we look at the whole uh, system of the evolution of the individual, which is being presented here in Bhagavad Gita, you'll see that there's a, a thread. And the thread is this, that the ordinary person is completely absorbed in what's going on in the external world. And they're completely oblivious to Krishna. Their obliviousness to Krishna, that is called Bhagavad Vimukata, that their consciousness is turned away from Krishna, is actually the cause of their experience of the material world. The soul is transcendental. The soul has no relationship with the material world whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Just as um, Vidura asked a question to Maitreya Rishi in the third canto, he said, that the material energy is inferior to the soul, then how is it possible that the soul is, uh, I, uh, is identifying with the material body and undergoing birth and death in the material world? In reply to that, Maitreya Rishi says, Seyam Bhagavato Maya Yanyayena Virudyate Ishvarasya Vimuktasya Karpanyam Utabandanam <laughs> My prayer, she says, the living entity cannot be degraded. What to speak of the being in bondage, being bound in this material world? The living entity is always Ishwara. Ishwara here, Ishwara means capable. The living entity, because he himself is the Chinmai, that is, he, he is composed of the Tasta Shakti, is a conscious energy, is not Achit, it is Chit. So he is by constitution conscious of himself. So Ishwarasya doesn't mean that the soul, the, the soul is the supreme Ishwara. The Ishwara means the soul has, is inherently capable of knowing himself because he's made of awareness. So Ishwarasya, Vimuktasya, and the soul is always liberated. He's never in bondage. However, Sayam Bhagavatomaya, 
Maya is an energy that belongs to Bhagavan, and it has the capability, it has the characteristic of yanyayena virudyate, that it can act inconceivably. It is a chintya, inconceivable, and it can contradict logic. So even though logically, how can a soul who is made of awareness not be aware? That doesn't make sense. How can the soul who is superior to the material energy, which is inferior to him, be in bondage? That doesn't make sense. So here, mm, see, uh, Maitre is saying, Supreme Lord has Achincha Shakti, inconceivable power, and so his Maya Shakti can make the impossible possible. That is, though the living entity has no uh, relation with material energy, by the influence of Maya, he identifies with the body and he also uh, forgets himself. So those are the two Shaktis of Maya that is called Avranatmika and Vikshepatmika. Avranatmika covers his awareness of himself, though he's made of awareness. And Vikshepatmika uh, makes him become distracted, giving him that identification with a body, which has nothing to do with him whatsoever. So he's thinking that he's moving in the cycle of birth and death and he's in bondage, but he was never in bondage. So now this inconceivable potency of Maya, which is Avarnatmika and Vikshepatmika, covering the soul and distracting the soul. The reason Maya is doing this is because the soul is Vimuk, completely indifferent to Sri Krishna. And therefore, Sri Krishna said to Uddhav in the 11th canto, and this is a very important verse. In fact, Srila Jiva Goswami has taken this verse to be a very foundational cornerstone of Bhakti Sandarbha when he wanted to explain in detail the, the, the necessity of Bhakti. He began with this by quoting this verse spoken by Krishna to Uddhav. Atma parigyana mayo vivada Hyastiti nastiti bidata nishta. Let me just look that up so I can tell you what number it is. Um, uh, I can't find that there. Okay, never mind. So uh, the verse is. At Maparigyana Mayovivada, it's definitely eleventh canto. Hyastiti nastiti bidata nishta. Naivo vyatopi naivo parameta pumsam. Maya paravrita diam salokat. It means this. Atma parigyana mayo. When the soul has the absence of awareness of God. Atma here means the, the Supreme Lord. Atma parajnana mayo bivada. When the living entity has the absence of awareness of God, mm -hmm. then vivada, he's thrown into a state of argumentation. Vivad. Vad vivad means theory and counter theory. So this is very interesting. If someone is not devoted to God, then they become lost in one theory after another. They'll accept one theory and believe it for some time. And then after some time, they'll, they'll uh, accept another theory and reject that. And they'll meet with people who have other theories and argue with them. And they'll try to defend their thesis against someone else's theory, thesis. But after some time, both sides will change their thesis even. They may even swap theses with each other. But this is what happens. Because when one is in a state of obliviousness to God, one becomes captured by the mature energy, the mental platform, which is always in the state of Sankalpa Vipakalpa, accepting and rejecting. So now one comes into the state of, of, the, of theoretical argumentation, Vad Vivad. So then he says, Hyastiti Nastiti Bidata Nishta. Hyastiti Nastiti means there is a God, there isn't a God. Hmm? So sometimes you'll think, that there is God, sometimes you think there isn't God. And due to having doubt in God, because God is the foundation of the whole world, after some time he'll even doubt the existence of the world. And he'll say, well, maybe the whole world's an illusion. 
Maybe the world doesn't even exist, you see? And then you start into going into forms of Mayavadi impersonalism and Buddhism also, uh, where in the Madhyamic Buddhism, then there's a sense that actually the world doesn't even, nothing exists. There's just shunya, emptiness, you see? So when there's the, the, the mind is turned away from God, then the vad, vivad comes, argumentation, and then there's a doubt, does God exist or not? Then there's a doubt, does the world exist or not? So then Krishna describes, and the person has nishta, he has faith in the process of argumentation. Mm-hmm. But even though all this argumentation is just coming from a very limited, conditioned way of thinking, and therefore it's a waste of time because you can never, you don't have the instruments, you don't have the information, you don't have the capabilities to actually come to a valid conclusion. And therefore, vyato, that means all of this philosophy is a complete waste of time. But vyato pi naivo parameta pum sam. Although all these philosophical speculations, arguments and counter-arguments are a complete waste of time, the, that soul cannot give it up. He cannot give it up. He's trapped in this short circuit forever. He cannot get up. And now in the last line, Krishna is giving the reason. Maya paravrita. Maya means from me and paravrita means turned away. Because his consciousness has turned away from me, He's trapped in this futile, endless speculation forever. Hmm? Uh, though I am uh, living in his heart, I am his life and soul, but he's turned away from me, and now he's s- stuck in this default mode of illusory speculations. So now, when we examine Bhagavad Gita in the light of this verse, what we see that each and every one of these steps, whether it's Karma Yoga, accepting the Vedas mm, to be giving the prescribed duties for life. Then working without attachment to the result, becoming free from the mode of passion. Then when you come to Sattva Gun, then you start to believe in God or at least the demigods. Mm. And uh, then you offer the results of your work to God. So now you work the whole day in forgetfulness of God, but at the end of the day, you came home and you prayed, oh God, I've done this for you. So that means your vimukata is being compromised. You are completely oblivious to God, but now you've started to think about God. Mm-hmm. And, but now Krishna is saying, not only in your prescribed duties, but everything that you do, do that as an offering, not only to Vishnu, but to the origin of Vishnu. So each stage is getting closer and closer and closer to turning the consciousness from the state of obliviousness that is vimukata to unmukata. And the degree to which a living being's consciousness is focused on Krishna, to that degree, the influence of maya, bodily identification, will gradually go away. Because Krishna Surya Sama Maya Hai Andhika Yahan Krishna Tahan Nahi Maya Adhika. Krishna is like the sun and Maya is like darkness. When one, ter- when one is, has his back to the sun, he sees only shadows. But as he turns himself towards Krishna, then he sees light. And when you're directly facing the light, then the shadows are behind you. So ma- you leave Maya behind. So here, Krishna is going a step further than he's gone before in Bhagavad Gita and saying, not only offer your duties, but offer everything that you do. Now, there's another, there's another step. We can go further in, in analyzing this verse. And that is that what if Yad Juhoshi, that means whatever sacrifice you perform, Juhoshi could also refer, refer to Archan because Yaj Yaj, from which the word yagya, sacrifice comes, also means to worship, to do archan according to rules and regulations. So what if we take yaj johoshi to mean worshipping the deity? Mm. And what if we take um, tapasyasi, what austerities you perform, let's take that to be following a kadasi. Mm. In the previous sense, 
uh, if it were only prescribed duties, tapas yasi would, re, uh, would refer to, for example, performing a vrat, like chandrayan vrat. Let's say in Vedic society, you're going about your duty, but anyway, when you light a fire, you kill some living entities. When you're walking around, you may step on some ants. So you're making some karma un, uh, unintentionally. You're committing some sins by killing other living beings. So in the Vedic culture, you're, uh, you have a prescription that you also have to do some austerities to purify you of sins which were formed unknowingly. So the Chandrayan Vrat is a, is a type of gradually increasing and decreasing fasting that you do in accordance with the movements of the moon. So when Krishna says in this verse, Yat Tapasyasi, whatever austerities that you perform within the context of Nashram Dharma, it will be referring to that. But still, instead of doing that austerity just to become free from the reactions of unintentional sins, at the end, you should say, oh my Lord, Krishna, I did this for you. And that will also um, increase your uh, unmukata, your attention on God. So, but let's say that Tapas Yasi didn't refer to austerities within Varnashram principles. Let's say that it referred to the um, performance of Akadasi, fasting on Akadasi. Then would this verse be Bhakti or not? Would it be Ananya Bhakti? Would it be Bhagavad Bhakti? Would it be Kevala Bhakti, pure Bhakti? And the answer is no. Why? The reason is this. If a person will fast on a Kadasi, then at the end of the day say, uh, Oh my Lord, I've done this for you. Please take results. Then this is not Bhakti. Because Bhakti is, as we mentioned before, it is the swallow Shakti of Sri Krishna. It is the energy coming from Sri Krishna's Swarup to his devotee who is fully surrendered to him. And from that devotee, from that guru to his disciple, from that guru to his disciple. And the vritti, that Swarup Shakti is transferred through surrender. So the, the disciple surrenders to his guru who is representing Krishna in order to receive that Swarup Shakti. And that empowers him to be able to serve Krishna directly. So first of all, bhakti is the vritti of Swarup Shakti. Always remember that. Bhakti is not just something that you do. It's not an action that you, ju you just get your body and you do it. But rather, bhakti is the vilas of Swarup Shakti. It's the play of Krishna's internal potency. It's the vritti, it's the function of Sri Krishna's internal potency. It only comes to a person who has fully surrendered themselves. For example, Prahlad Maharaj said, Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smarnam Pada Sevanam Achanam Bandanam Dasyam Sakyam Atmani Vedanam. There are nine angas of bhakti hearing, chanting, remembering, and serving, etc. But then he said, Iti pom sa pita vishnau bhaktis chen navalakshana kreti bhagavatteda tanya utamam. I consider that person to be the most learned who first offers himself completely to the Supreme Lord and then engages in hearing, chanting, and remembering. Why? Because when a person surrenders, that is the doorway to bhakti, then when he gives up his independence, when he feels, I no longer belong to myself, oh my Lord, I am yours, I exist only for your enjoyment, then the door to bhakti opens and the vritti of Swarup Shakti comes and begins to take over his senses. And then when he engages, not in the prescribed duties of Varnashram Dharma, hmm? but engages in Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam, hearing, chanting, and remembering about Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes. These are the activities of bhakti because they're Swarup Anubandi. They're related to your soul. The activities of Varnashram Dharma are related to the body and they're, and they're temporary. First of all, the Atma has no true relation to the body. The only reason you're offering the fruit of your activity to Krishna is a trick to get you to think of Krishna, right? The, it's not the activity which is important. 
It's the, that we are Bhagavat Vimuk. We are turned away from Krishna. And this is an excuse to turn towards to Krishna somehow or other. Krishna is not interested in you offering the fruit of your work. It's for you to become Bhagavat Unmuk. For example, in chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, Namam karmani limpanti, name kama phalais priha, iti mam yo bijanati, kama be nasa badhyate. If a person, this is in chapter 4, let me, let me just see. Uh, chapter 4, oh, it's verse 14. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verse 14. So Sri Krishna is saying, that uh, if a person, itimam yobijanati, if a person knows that, namam karma nilimpanti, when I act in this world, I am not entangled in karma. Hmm? Just like, a, uh, just as a spider creates the work, the, his web, and the spider can walk around in his web very freely. So similarly, Krishna has manifested this world and he walks around it, in it freely without getting entangled. But if a fly will come to the same web, whatever he does is just entangling him. So that's the difference. The ordinary person, whatever karma he does, is tangling him in the world. Whereas Krishna, because he's the creator of the world, he's not tangled. So Krishna says, Namam karmani limpanti, I am not affected by my own activities. Name karma phalais priha, and I don't desire the karma foul, the fruit of my activities. So one who knows this about me, karma being nasa badyate, he is never bound by karma. So that means if you just recognize Krishna is God, his activities are not karma, they're all transcendental lila. So one who realizes that, then that person himself, when he's acting in the world, he's also not affected by karma and he also doesn't get the material fruit of karma, but everything that's happening to him, Krishna himself is, is giving. As we began with that sutra in the, in the very beginning of the class, the Sutra of Vedanta, um, that is uh, 3, 4, 44. Swamina, um, Swamina, uh, Falasrute, Atrayaha, Iti Atrayaha. So, now the important line here is, I don't want the fruit of my own work. So if Krishna doesn't want the fruit of his own work, then he doesn't want the fruit of our work, that's for sure. So if we are doing our work and offering the fruit to Krishna, is that bhakti? Does, bhakti means giving Krishna what he wants. He doesn't want name karma for lace prayer. He doesn't want the fruit of his own work. Why would he want the fruit of our work? So we don't offer the fruit of work to Krishna because he wants it. But that is just a chance for us to become, to give up our Bhagavad, Bhagavad Vimukata, our uh, obliviousness to Krishna and become attentive to Krishna. So this is why even if this verse were uh, done, everything is done for Krishna, it's still not bhakti because the uh, karmas related to the body have no eternal relation with our soul or with Krishna whatsoever. And so they're not pleasing to Krishna. It's just a pretext. Krishna is telling us to do this as a pretext for us to remember him. And uh, another reason, the second reason why, even if you follow this verse fully, it's still not bhakti, is because Krishna is saying, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever austerities you perform, do that as an offering to me, means that the activity, whatever it is, you're offering it to him, but you have not offered yourself. You have not given yourself. And therefore, it can never be bhakti. But Arjuna is playing the role of a person who is too qualified to perform just karma, but not yet qualified to follow Ananyas Chintayantamam. And that is why Sri Krishna is speaking this verse, Yat Karosi Yadashnasi, uh, here in Bhagavad Gita chapter 9. So the, the analysis of Krishna's words is extremely important so that we can understand the standard of what is Uttama Bhakti, that is what is Kevala Bhakti, Ananya Bhakti, 
pure, unadulterated, transcendental devotion to Sri Krishna. Jai. Sri Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Gaur Premanandi. Hari Hari Bo. So, we've uh, completed our discussion on Bhagavad Gita for today. I hope there was some inspiration for you. You've, and you've all learned something fascinating from the words emanating from the lips of our most beautiful and beloved Sri Krishna. So if there are any questions, you can... Um, oh, does someone have to manage this? I have to manage it myself. Okay. If you have a question, you can uh, turn your microphone on and raise your hand first, perhaps, and turn on your microphone on and you can ask your question. So... Who's there? Srila uh, Gurudev. Yes, yes. Drista Prabhu, my pronouns to you. What's your question? My, my pronoun, it's very simple. For all of us, given our, our levels, what is the best way to really offer ourselves to Krishna? Well, the offering of the self to, to Krishna is the surrender. You know, that is, that is why in Bhakti there are 64 angas, but what is the first one? Guru Pad Ashray. That's it. Guru Pad Ashray. The, the um, taking shelter of the instructions of Guru, serving according to his guidance without being, having a spirit of independence, uh, that opens the door to Bhakti. Literally, Rupa Goswami said that the first 20 angas of, de, of the 64 angas of devotional service, beginning with Guru Pad Ashray, are called the Pravesh Dwara, the entrance into Uttama Bhakti. So if one is under guidance of Dikshiguru or Shikshiguru, serving under their guidance, hearing, chanting and remembering, and um, serving, doing things such as organizing programs, preaching, going on Sankirtan, distributing books, uh, studying Shastra, serving your deities, and so all of these things, they're all the... Um, the aspect of Guru Padashrai from the beginning by which one gradually becomes eligible for the experience of Uttam Bhakti, the experience of Swarup Shakti. Uh, the experience of Swarup Shakti will begin really um, when Nishta, when one is established in Nishta, Bhakti begins to appear and then its true nature is really experienced in the stage of Ruchi. Up until then, the Shraddha, before Nishta is called Komala Shraddha, and the Komala Shraddha uh, as long as the faith is soft, then there's a little bit of karma adhikar, which means that there's, a, there's a, a certain element within the devotee's life where they can do their worldly duties, but they should do them without any attachment. And uh, uh, they should think, I have offered myself to Supreme Lord, and I'm only uh, doing these worldly duties to maintain this house, which is Krishna's house, and this is my deity of Krishna, and Krishna is living here. So I am collecting money to serve Krishna, to feed Krishna, to clothe Krishna, to make programs for devotees and everything like this. So even the worldly activities can be directed, directly connected with Sri Krishna. Um, so that Adhikar is there as long as the uh, Komala Shraddha, still some Komala Shraddha is present. And when the, when the Shraddha becomes firm, then those things are not necessary. Then the devotee can do one of two things. Either he can become renounced like a brahmachari or a sannyasi, or if the home situation is favorable for bhakti, then he can practice there. Like Srila Bhakti no Thakur, though he was a householder, like Srivast Thakur and many others, uh, their mm, household life was not uh, problematic. Yeah? Sula Bhakti Nautaku's wife was not asking him, oh, please, I, I need another Louis Vuitton purse and some new shoes or another five pairs of shoes or anything. His wife was also a devotee. She was not harassing him. So for, for those type of devotees, then it's not a problem. And sometimes to stay within the household in the Grihastha ashram is favorable. But if that's unfavorable, they can uh, renounce outwardly. When that nishta comes, the firmness of faith comes, and one is no longer eligible for any type of worldly karma, 
Even the devotee who stays within the household situation is actually a sannyasi. Even Srila Bhaktivinoda is not even sannyasi. That means uh, Kutichak, Bahutak, Hamsa, but he's a Paramahamsa. He's the, in the, even in the fourth stage of sannyasi, even while remaining at home, due to being completely liberated. So all those uh, considerations are there in regard to surrender and the path that one takes even when the surrender becomes mature. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for that nice answer. You're most welcome. You're very merciful to me. To, you are inspiring me to speak all these katas and pastimes. So you're very merciful to me. And, uh, are there any other questions? Hare Krishna. Uh, yes, Rishikesh Prabhu. My pronouns to you. Please accept my wishes. First. What a wonderful class. Um, uh, one question I, I wanted to understand about uh, this is Namam Karmani Lipanti. Anyone who understands that the Lord's activities are transcendental, uh, he also doesn't get entangled. So how do, how do I really understand this? Because I have <laughs> accepted it. <laughs> So that means whatever I'm doing is exactly. <laughs> So you you can see here the word is he he says itim mam yo bijanati. So the word is abijanati, not janati. Janati would just mean if someone knows, but here is abijanati. That means completely knows. Uh -huh. So completely knows means he realizes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, and it's exactly the same. This verse is saying the same um, idea, which is expressed in the famous verse of chapter 4, 9. Um, Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tattva daha. Chakva diham puna jamma neti mameti sojana. One who knows in truth <laughs> the nature of my birth and activities. So there's a, there, there's a condition here. It's not just one who knows theoretically or one who accepts theoretically, but tattva, <laughs> in tattva, that you actually realize it. Then that person, he uh, will not take birth again, and that person is no longer affected by any karma. So what does that mean? That means chant Hare Krishna. Uh -huh. Actually, the purport of every verse in every Shastra is chant Hare Krishna, <laughs> really. Because... When a person chants the holy name without offense, then in his heart he sees the transcendental form and qualities and associates of Krishna. And once one has that realization of Krishna's swarup, then he knows, oh, oh my Lord, you are so beautiful. You are eternal. You are beyond time and space. You are the tattva. You are yourself the tattva. Here, tattva doesn't mean only to know Krishna in tattva. It means to know that Krishna is the tattva. He is the supreme reality. Just like the Vedas say, Om Tat Sat. Om is the self-manifest Tat, Tattva, the Supreme Truth, which is Sat, self-manifest. So um, the, the Vedas, the Upanishads, speak about the Tattva, the Param Tattva, and so on. So when one realizes that not only Krishna, but Krishna and his activities, his Leela, his being born from the womb of Madhya Shoda in Gokul, his stealing butter, He's dancing on the head of Kaliya. He's lifting Govardhan Hill. He's dancing with the Braji Gopis in Raslila. All of this together is Tattva, the Supreme Reality. Everything taken together, that is the Tattva, Supreme Reality. That person will never take birth again. But that realization comes in a Kram, in a sequence, to those who chant the Holy Name, giving up the Ten Offenses. So, this is the meaning of Iti mam yo bijanati kama bir sa na sabadhyati. This was. Thank you. Very, very good question. This is a very good question. So, you know, scripture always has to be understood according to tattva vichar. There are two vichars, or vichar means uh, deliberation, consideration. Dristikon, perspective. So generally people read scripture and they take what is called aparavicha. Not the paravicha, not the transcendental consideration, but aparavicha, the inferior worldly understanding, an inferior 
material interpretation. And that happens a lot, even in the devotional community among the Konishta Adhikaris. They read the scripture and they go, aha, I've understood it. But their vichara, their deliberation is aparavichara. Now that understanding of scripture, which is aparavichara, though it's inevitable, though it's preliminary stage, but it will not bring one to pure bhakti. No one can become a pure devotee by aparavichara, and that is why one has to understand scripture according to tattva vichar, tattva, tattva, as it is. The word tattva really means as it is. That's why Srila Prabhupada called Bhagavad as it is. So that tattva vichar only comes around when we hear tattva. Tattva vit Vaishnavas. That's why see Krishna, he says that mm, the... Mm, Tadvidi pranipate na pariprasnena sevaya upadekshanti teyanam gyaninas tattva darshinaha. You have to go to a tattva darshi, one who knows the tattva vichar, and serve them and ask questions. Slowly, slowly, upadekshanti teyanam, they will in, impart that tattva to you. Uh, just like we see the examples of, of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu how he went to Ramananda Rai, and then he instructed Sanatana Goswami and Rupa Goswami. So there it is said that uh, Krishna Tattva, Bhakti Tattva, Rasa Tattva Pranta, Leela Tattva, Krishna Tattva, Bhagavad Siddhanta. So it is said that whatever Chaitanya Mahaprabhu learned about Krishna Tattva, Bhakti Tattva, Rasa Tattva, Leela Tattva, from Ramananda Rai, that's what he taught to Rupa Goswami. That's what he taught to Sanatan Goswami. So one has to have the association of pure devotees and gradually learn Guru Tattva, Krishna Tattva, Maya Tattva, Nam Tattva, Bhakti Tattva, Sadhan Tattva, Bhav Tattva, Prem Tattva, Rasa Tattva, Lila Tattva, Prem Tattva, Vilas Tattva. Krishna Lila, Nikunji Vilast, all these things. One has to understand them as they are, not as you read them in a book and then think I have understood. Mm -hmm. And this process only goes on uh, through hearing. That's why we were discussing the other day about Guru Tattva, Tadvigyanatam Sagurum Eva Bigatet. To get the Vigyan, realized knowledge, one must approach Guru. And who is Guru? Samit Pani Sotriam Brahma Nishtam. The Guru is Srotram, that means he himself has received all the tattvas through the hearing process from his Guru. So he can then give that Shabda Brahma, the transcendental vibration, to the next generation. Thank you for your Thank beautiful you. question. It was Thank very you. essential uh, yeah. in regard it to the me... principle of spiritual life. Yeah, this makes me wonder about my disposition now. You know? <laughs> Because I have really honestly not realized these things, but I have long way to go. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. But you have the you have the um, eagerness to inquire, the inquisitiveness. Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Mm -hmm. Now inquire, be very eager uh, to know the truth. So when that eagerness is there and we have the pure Vaishnava association, then surely then the tattvas become transferred. Mm -hmm. That is uh -huh. mm, Veta Tvam, so this is what the Shonika Rishi said to um, Sutta Goswami. Veta Tvam, so me tatsavam, tatvatas tadanugrahat, bruyusnik dasasisasya, guru voguyam apiyata. Because you have served your spiritual masters with great affection, then for sure you know the secrets and they have given you all the tatvas. Hmm? So. So all these principles are directly, it's an open secret. It's there in Srimad Bhagavatam. Thank you so much. I think Krishna Priya, Didi has a question. Hare Krishna. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, good. Thank you very much for the wonderful explanation. And as usual, after hearing, I realize how much I'm lacking and how much I'm dependent upon the association because on my own, I don't feel the capacity to even begin devotional service. And so you should also feel 
that Krishna's words are deep like an ocean. Even though you may have heard them again and again, you can still go deeper. Much deeper, just on the surface. So my question is, Guru Davis, in regards to surrender, is that something that is day by day and moment by moment that, that we learn how to surrender? Mm. It is that free will is always with the jiva. So a person can surrender right now in one moment, or it may take a long time. And uh, the anarchists, they will be also eradicated in proportion to the degree of surrender. And if his one is only surrendered so much, but then engages in bhakti with that surrender, that will start to also clear away more anarta, and then the devotee having a more clear mind, being more alert. Then he says, what am I doing? I'm not fully surrendered. I should be fully surrendered. So that uh, free will is with, with the jiva. But, you know, it's really, really about humility. The reason we don't surrender is because we feel that we have our own strength. And this is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's greatest gem that he gave to the world, and he said, where is always around your neck? Trinada peace who need chena. Tarora peace is shuna. Amani na amani dhinya kitanya sadahari. One should consider oneself more humble than a blade of grass. Because only when we realize that we are helpless, then we take shelter, you see? Because shelter means that you become dependent on the mercy of someone else. But you will not take shelter if you feel like, well, I don't need that much shelter. I'm like kind of pretty strong myself. I have capabilities. I have capacity. I have strength. <laughs> so it's only by very finely deliberating on how we are helpless, how we are fully dependent, and then we can take shelter. That I am the, um, the fully dependent, that means who is our shelter? They, they are the uh, Ashrai, and I am Ashrita. I am Ashrita. Just like in, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is speaking about Purush and Prakriti. And he says, I am the Purush. And the jivas are my, the material energy is my property, and the jivas are superior property. So jivas are also property in relation to Krishna. But what does that mean? Purush is the ashray, and the property is ashray. That, that which is in shelter of the purush is the property. That, that which is in shelter of the shelter. Like this. So to know jiva tattva, I am a jiva, means to know that Krishna is the purush and I am property. And therefore, you cannot know Jiva Tattva without being surrendered. The, the, if a person is not surrendered, that means they didn't understand Jiva Tattva. Yes. Right? Yes. See, one can write a whole list. I know about Jiva Tattva. First of all, the Jiva is part and parcel of Krishna. He is the Tatasta Shakti, is the energy of Krishna. The Jiva is eternal. He has no beginning, middle, and end. All the, you can say so many things. But until you realize, wait a minute, I'm a Shakti. And the Shakti is Ashrit, and the Purush is the Ashrai. <laughs> so until we see how f that we are, acknowledge our complete dependence in everything, mm? just like a baby in the womb, like a fetus in the womb, cannot move and is totally dependent on the mother for everything. And before we, we accept that, then we don't surrender, actually. You see? So that beautiful verse is there, taught by Lord Kapila Dev how the soul in the womb is praying. It's not just, don't think, well, the next time I'm a fetus, I'll remember that verse, right? <laughs> uh, we shouldn't be like that. We have to understand that this is an illustration of surrender and it's relevant to us right now. Hmm? That I, Krishna says that I am the seed giving father. I put all the jivas in the womb of the material energy. So right now we're kind of trapped in the material energy and we can't get out. So we're already like that fetus. And so it just takes some sobriety, some clarity of mind, um, some dira, bidira, to be 
to be a sober person and consider, wow, I am Atma, I am Shakti, I am the Ashrit, Krishna is my only Ashray. I am in, I am not, I cannot be independent. The thought that I am independent is an illusory idea because we're never independent. So everyone's dependent on Krishna at all times. It's only a question of, of accepting it or not accepting it. So by accepting this, and then we surrender to uh, see Krishna under the guidance of his representative, Sri Guru, and then everything can go on. And it can be done in a moment. It is like uh, Sila Sanatana Goswami said, giving up the false ego is as easy as blinking your eyes or as easy as plucking a flower. But we just don't do it. And so this is why it's important every day to sing the bhajans of the acharyas. You know, the bhajans of the acharyas express that yes. humility, that dependence. And that's why it's important every day to remember our Gayatri mantras because the mantras, they, they are that swaha, that namaha is reminding us again and again, making that sanskar of our complete dependence. Uh, and then all of our, our hearing, chanting and remembering should be imbued with that spirit completely. So Katvanga you, you, you see, um, Prikshit Maharaj asked the same question, more or less. He said, he said to Shukadeva Goswami, look, I've got seven days left to live. <laughs> How can I attain the perfection of life? Shukadeva Goswami said, don't panic. There was a king named Katvanga Maharaj. <laughs> and Katvanga Maharaj, he, he had served the demigods and pleased them in battle. So he said, we'll, they get, said, we'll give you a benediction. What do you want? He said, um, just tell me, how long have I got left to live? <laughs> they said, you're going to die in 24 minutes. He said, okay, just take me down to earth. Because in the heavenly planets, there's too much material enjoyment, too much distraction. So he came down to earth. And, uh, and just in, in one minute, he surrendered. And he became perfect. So that's always with us. Hmm? Always with us. So just take a, a piece of paper, write on it, no excuses. And stick it <laughs> on the wall above your bed. No excuses. <laughs> no excuses. Thank you, Gurudev. We can always surrender if we're not in, intoxicated by our ego and living in a state of distraction. You, you always, um, you give such a beautiful coming attraction to what it means to surrender that it, it always waters such a desire within the heart. Well, so you I'm know, really, really the, thing grateful. Is, the reason we don't dis surrender is because we want to enjoy. But the reason we're not enjoying is because we, we're unhappy is because we're not surrendered. So, <laughs> this is the so kind, of the takes everything away. <laughs> <laughs> like Srila Bhaktivinoda Tako said, Atmani Vedana Tuya Padikari Hoinu Paramasuki Dukkha dure gelo, chinta naro hilo, deke. Oh my Lord, since I surrender to you, I've become completely happy. And everywhere I look, I only see joy. I, all my worries have gone. I cannot even remember what is the coronavirus. I cannot even remember <laughs> the lockdown rules. I cannot even remember anything. I am just in this. Huh? So that's, that's, my guru Dev always used to ask the devotees if he saw he hadn't seen them for a long time he would say are you happy <laughs> and, and but the deeper question it wasn't a mundane question it was a question are you surrendered because if if you're surrendered you're happy and if you're not happy you're not surrendered thank you very much Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So i think we'll complete our little virtual namahata program this week that is brought to you by the mercy of guru and Goranga by the mercy of Nit and Prabhu from Sarabi Kunj in Godrum Dweep, Navadweep, we had our little Namahata program, which is just a small branch of his original marketplace of the Holy Name, where Nit and Prabhu is giving love to everyone just at the price of their faith. Jai. Nit and Prabhu ki jai. Sachinanda jai. Balekundavan Bihari Lala ki jai. Jai Jai Sri Gaur Premanandi Hari 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 Hari